Bonjour, my name is Eli. I work at Google, where I lead the security and anti-abuse research team. Today, with Jean-Michel, which is here in spirit, we're going to tell you how we can use deep learning to reduce side channel attack surface. Before getting started, I would like to point out that the results you're about to see are part of a larger project that we do in collaboration with many Googlers and external collaborators around hardening hardware cryptography to create more secure devices. Such an attack is one of the most efficient ways to attack secure hardware because instead of targeting the algorithm, which is usually well understood and well scrutinized, let's say alias, instead it targets the implementation and the interplay with the given hardware. And this is well less scrutinized because A, there is many of them, and B, it is way more subtle to understand how side effect of code affect a specific hardware and how that can be exploited by attackers. Here is a concrete example to show you how powerful such an attack are. Back in 2017, researchers were able to recover uh, Bitcoin private keys out of a Trezor hardware wallet uh, by using such an attack. They show you that despite the algorithm being well reviewed and the, the hardware being well understood, the interplay between the two uh, still had some problems and that were that you can exploit through such an attack. And from this Defender side, such an attack are very difficult because they are very hard to debug and fix it. So even if you know you have a side channel, it's really hard to know where it's coming from and what you can do to fix it. So if such an attack are both very important and hard to debug, it means that there is a room for innovation on how to help with the situation. And that's where these projects come in. And our idea was maybe we can try to develop new technology to accurately pinpoint the code which is vulnerable to such an attack, so developer can quickly isolate it and try to improve it and strengthen and improve the quality of the implementation and be more resilient to such an attack. So that was the idea we had, and then the way we went about that was uh, we proposed to use uh, deep learning and dynamic analysis and combine the two to be able to accurately pinpoint the origin of the leakage which is responsible or which is exploited by a given side channel attack. And I know, I know uh, what you're thinking, you're going to be like, oh my God, one more deep learning talk. Really, it's all going to be all hype and et cetera, et cetera. Well, actually, no. Uh, this talk, as I promise, is a hacker journey, so we want to make it very concrete. And what we really want to do today is showcase to you our debugging tool, which we call SCOLD, uh, which stands for Side Channel Attack Leak Detector, and how that works in practice. And to make it very concrete, uh, today I'm going to show you how we can use code uh, to debug TinyAS, a very vanilla, plain implementation of AES, running on a well-known uh, CPU, which is the SMT32F4. So we're going to really see in practice today how you can use the technique we developed to isolate a very clear leakage. And hopefully by the end of the talk, you will have a good understanding of what the tool is about and why it might be useful if you are working in the field of cryptography and hardware crypto, or if you are interested in the subject. So with this, uh, how are we going to go about that? First, I'm going to briefly detail how such an attack works. Then we're going to discuss how AI-based such an attack works because we are need, we need those to be able to pinpoint the leakage. Then I'm going to deep dive a little bit into what is AI explainability and how you go about explaining what a machine learning sees or understand or how it makes a decision. And finally, we'll bring everything together. I talked to a little bit about the dynamic analysis part of the project and how we fit all together to, well, pinpoint the leakage and I'll show you how it works in practice for the target, uh, our tiny AS on SMT32. We can follow along by getting the slide at the very least and hopefully link to the code by going to elite.net slash code. As I mentioned, uh, the, pro the purpose of this talk is to be uh, very practical, done to us on how can you use and how this type of tool works at a high level and how can you use it as a practitioner, not necessarily how you can develop such a technique and how you can research on how to improve it. If this is something you are interested in, uh, we are working on a paper, a research paper, which have all the technical detail about the expansion technique we use, the benchmarking and alternative and all the good stuff. And hopefully 
um, the paper will be out shortly uh, by the time you see this recording or will have been already put on archive by the time you see it. Uh, with that out of the way, uh, what is, let's start with uh, recapping what such an attack are. At its core, a such an attack is an indirect measurement of a computation result using an auctionary mechanism. So basically, instead of observing directly the result, we try to infer what it is uh, using a third-party way, uh, which is what we call an auxiliary me mechanism. Uh, such an attack uh, are used in many, many ways uh, to attack various targets. Uh, obviously, as discussed in this talk, uh, they are used to recover encryption key out of hardware secure implementation. They also use uh, in web security to perform blind SQL injection, where you cannot see the return of a SQL statement on SQL injection. And then they also used uh, in to steal password and pins from secure implementation. And they also use, as I mentioned in the early example uh, at the beginning, uh, to recover uh, crypto wallet uh, target keys. And those are only four examples of the many ways you can do such an attack, which is basically when do you need to evaluate something you cannot observe, such an attack is usually the way to go. Let's make that a little bit more concrete for a use case. So when you do a computation uh, for crypto, what you do is you feed a plain text and you feed a secret key and the algorithm is running on the CPU and while it's running, uh, we have some leakage. Uh, the first one is how long the computation takes. Uh, what is not very relevant to AS when you have hardware acceleration, actually depending on the computation, uh, the time may change depending on the key. That was mostly used for RSA a long time ago because RSA uh, use exponentiations and when it's not constant time, it can actually help to recover the key. That's one of the example, but again, timing is how long the computation takes. Then we have the one we use in this talk, which is current. Uh, of course, depending on the operation you do, depending on how many registers you load, how many registers you unload, the amount of power consumption will vary uh, from uh, clock to clock. And so that's what we can measure and that's what we can use to infer what is happening. Then we have a third one, which is uh, less used, uh, but is still possible, it is heat. Of course, depending on which part of the, which type of operation you do, different parts of the CPU will be used, and as a result, some parts will be hotter than others. Uh, a little bit arcane, not most rarely used, I think. I haven't seen very much concrete example, but it does exist. Last but not least, we also have what we call electron magnetic emission, EM, and EM is also a very powerful channel, uh, widely used to recover uh, public keys. It is with current probably one of the two most used uh, in such an attack, uh, timing being uh, also important as I mentioned, but really current and EM is probably like the two leading technologies these days. What does it look like in practice? So here is a power trace of a AS. And if you look carefully in the middle of the slide, you will see, well, about 10 times the same pattern, and they do correspond to the 10 round of AES. So you can visually see on a non-protected or very likely protected AES that we can observe the round uh, by just looking at the power trace. If we can observe it as a human, it means there are some statistical information there that can be exploited to understand what is happening. And that's, in a sense, uh, this such an error, this side effect. Uh, that we can use to recover an AS key. In a nutshell, how you go about that? Well, you get a CPU, that's the target, uh, to do the encryption. And what you do is you do record while the encryption is performed the power trace using uh, an oscilloscope. Uh, and then in the traditional session attack, uh, the state of the art is called a template attack, where you basically combine the traces you observe and you make statistical estimates on what it could be, and the statistical estimate will help you to recover your AS key. This is how it works. Uh, if you wonder what type of hardware we use, uh, and again, this is what we use, doesn't mean that's the best, just what works for us. Uh, we use a new AE Chip Whisperer Pro, and for some of our work, However, not this talk, we also use a Picoscope 6000 when we need faster sampling, when the target is very fast, and we need a lot of information. So for example, last year, when we talked about Scammer, which is a way to do um, uh, such an attack using machine learning, uh, which we're going to briefly recap in a second, then we do use a Picoscope. For this work, we just use uh, plain old uh, cheap whisperers. And again, this is not an app. Uh, this is just happened to be 
what we use in practice as how we want to make this talk as concrete as we can. Now that we have an idea of what a session attack are, let's talk about how you would go about using AI to perform such attack. Well, uh, this is something we call session attack automated with machine learning, also known as KEMO. Uh, this is what we did present in DAPS last year, uh, but let me briefly recap uh, how they work in practice uh, because we're going to need the model that we create using a scammer attack to do the explainability and then find out what the leakage is. If you want to have more detail, by the way, about this type of attack, well, you can check out last year's talk. Uh, it's available at the, on, the, on my website at ellie.net slash camo. Uh, I also probably put a link on to Twitter uh, if you want to follow along. And again, you have way more detail. I'm going to try to shrink down the explanation as much as I can, so you can follow along. But if you want all the details, uh, they are in the previous talk. I also want to say this year is different from last year, uh, so for people who follow both, uh, in two senses. Uh, this time, last year when we talked about using machine learning to attack hardware encryption, we took the worst case, which is we are doing black box attack, where we are the attacker doesn't have any knowledge about the target, and for example, cannot have access to the clock because the clock is usually uh, not accessible after when the key is in, uh, or the hardware implementation is in production mode, right? And so as a result, we were collecting trace in a asynchronous manner, which means that the clock of the target and the clock of the oscilloscope were different, which is why we had to use very high sampling rate. In this specific case, we, this year we are changing the model because this time it's called is for people who are developing implementation. So we do assume you have the code, uh, you have the hardware target, you can put it in debug mode, and so we don't need to create uh, asynchronous traces. We also have a good idea, if you're a developer, at what time AS start and to what time it ends, so you can also create shorter traces. Uh, the reason why to do shorter captures is because machine learning have an easier time if you don't capture the whole thing, because that means it spends less time when it trains to eliminate part of the trace which is useless. So again, this is a white box attacker model. Uh, it makes more sense for that work. However, do not try to compare the model you use in this talk, which are easier and smaller than the one in the previous talk where we had a way harder task for the machine learning, right? So when you're in the black box, the machine learning work harder, which means you have to train more and use more complicated and more uh, deeper architectures. In the case of a white box, when you are really laser focusing on one part of the implementation, uh, here will be the first round, we don't need that. The way uh, session and attack assisted by machine learning works is very similar to the traditional session and attacks, right? As in the previous case, you have the encryption which is running, and then you have, uh, you capture the trace. Uh, don't forget that you capture the trace and you store them to normalize them between one and minus one because machine learning actually works in that range, uh, which is not what your traditional oscilloscope will output. And then uh, we feed those uh, traces to a deep neural network and we are going to make prediction on what he thinks are uh, the value uh, which can be used to recover the key. Uh, and then we combine those with uh, to do a statistical estimate and hopefully you get back your AS key. Uh, the, one of the advantages of that, as illustrated last year, is that you do not need to do any kind of pre-processing. Uh, you can just feed the trace directly and there is less expert knowledge on it, so that it's open to place uh, to do that almost automatically. And so that make it a little bit easier and also it's more powerful than, in a sense, than the traditional template attack because of the reason I mentioned. When you do a session and attack, you do not necessarily directly target to recover the key. Uh, you target what we call attack point. Uh, in the case of tiny AAS, uh, there are three, two points which works really well, uh, which is a sub-byte in, which is when you XOR the key with a plain text. And there is also the sub-byte out, which is when you look at the output of the else box. In this talk, uh, we're going to focus on one of them, uh, which is a sub byte in, which we know works really well, uh, based on my experience, and this is something which is a point. So basically, the so machine learning will not predict the key. That really doesn't work when you try that, but instead, going to predict the sub byte in, and will basically, if you want to do the real attack, you take the sub byte in, and then you have to invert it uh, 
using the plain text, so do another XOR and then you get the key and then you can do your prediction, right? So the target point today is subbyteen. When the machine learning will predict the subbyteen, uh, what it does is you get a trace and then it tells you, okay, here is a soft max, so a almost a probabilistic output of 256 value and tell you which is the most important value, but also what you think is the second best value, so that value of the fourth, and that's what the softmax do. So what you do uh, on how to combine those things, uh, that's why we call it a probabilistic attack, is you basically sum them up uh, using log 10 uh, because of rounding errors, and then you combine them, and hopefully by combining them, solving them, you get the most uh, likely value, and the machine learning is correct most of the time, that will quickly converge. Uh, last year we showed that for 10 years on a full trace, we only need four traces. So you can see, you will see that in the specific settings today, where it's even easier, well, you need as little as that too. So basically in three, four traces for simple cases, you get the correct value and you have recover one byte of the key. Uh, what's important to mention as well here is we have one model per byte. Uh, so if you have 16 bytes, which is the normal input, we have in reality 16 models which are performing one byte at a time. It is easier for the machine learning to predict one byte at a time, so, well, you have to train 16 times. Uh, I'm not going to show that on the slide because it's not relevant. If you can do it for one, you can do it for 16. However, there are some different of accuracy between the bytes, but that's not too relevant uh, for this talk. Okay. Uh, for those who are curious, um, this year we use a hyper-tuned uh, residual 1D convolution neural network. Uh, the difference between this model and last year is this model is way more efficient. Uh, it's, it's smaller and I think it's 300,000 points or something, 300,000 neurons, parameters. Uh, it's way too tuned and it works really well out of the box. Uh, this is kind of like our go-to model this day which is based on our previous work and testing a ton and a ton of models. Uh, the paper, I said it last year, it's kind of funny, but uh, the paper on all our tests about all the machine learning models will be out some point. at some point. I said last year it will be soon. Uh, we have some technical difficulty to make everything reproducible and we have a lot of improvement, but hopefully, I'm really hopeful, knocking on wood, uh, these, model, these models and the data that we use to gain our expertise into this Will be out and you guys can test it out uh, hopefully in the near future. For scaled, uh, you need the 16 models uh, because you need to know uh, what, what is the commonality between all the bytes to narrow down exactly what is the main source of leakage. So you train uh, 16 models. Uh, as I mentioned, the accuracy varies. As you can see, you reach something to see the validation accuracy to be clear. Uh, so on data which have not been seen during the training, you reach something between 63 for the worst one, which I think is by four, up to 87% uh, for the best one, which is by zeros. And again, they are all between that. Um, for scold, it doesn't really matter. What you need is to be able to isolate enough examples that the machine learning is correct, because those are the ones we're going to use for explainability, because we want to know what is the model is using when it's correct. So that's why we don't train more than that. Try to imagine each of them is about, I would say, 15 to 20 minutes. So you do three per hour and you have 16 to go. So, you know, that's already about five hours uh, of training time. So we don't want to do 20 epochs, uh, which would be completely overkill. And as I said, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, because of 10 years is not protected against high channel attacks and our model is really well optimized, uh, we have high accuracy in, for, in five epochs for all of them. Now, the model is good at extracting the key, so we are able to use it and we can consistently recover keys. Now the question is, okay, how does that help us to go back and, well, find where the leak is coming from? Well, this is where you need to add another piece, which is deep learning explainability. So what is deep learning explainability? Deep learning explainability was first developed, I believe, for vision. And the idea was, I have a deep learning network and it says, in this picture, we have a boxer and we have a tiger cat. Now you can ask the question, okay, but why? Does it really look at the cat? Does it really look at the dog or does it look uh, at statistics? I don't know, maybe the stripe in the, uh, the stripe colors of the tail of the cat or maybe the dog have a leash or something like that. So what you want to do is you want to have a way to ask the neural network, what do you look at, right? And that's what 
uh, explainability is about is being able to say for a model how does it come up with a given prediction why for this specific class output put so one of output neuron what did you use as input and what was input matter to you right so it's basically almost inverting the machine learning model if you will and so we call that explainability <coughs> there are many techniques but the idea is you all the techniques have in common that you feed the machine the, the model to the explainer then you feed the input you would like information about and then you have to tell him which class you want to have an explanation for. This is why, as I explained earlier, uh, we need for school to have models which work well, not necessarily 99%, but at least very well, because we need to have examples of predictions which are successful because we want to know for a given trace and a successful prediction what to think. So, as I mentioned, you give it to the explainer, the other side, uh, you put the, get back the picture we had and we say, okay, why do you believe it was a boxer? And hopefully they will tell you, well, I look at the face of the, of the puppy and it's a boxer. And you're like, okay, that's reasonable. And you can ask also, okay, how about the cat? And hopefully, and again, those are real examples out of one of the expansion techniques, it will tell you, well, I look at the cat and the reason why I think it's a cat is because, well, there is a face of a cat, but the most important thing is there are stripes. As you can see, the right part of the, the part which is right in the image, and you're like, okay, that makes sense. I guess a cat which has stripes is probably a tiger cat. Makes sense. The machine learning is actually looking at what it should. Was it technique ever useful? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, there is this very, very famous uh, data set in uh, machine learning for vision and it's called the Pascal vocabulary, visual vocabulary. And what happened was in the early version of this data set, I think one picture in five for horses had a top, bottom left, sorry, bottom left uh, name of who took it. And what the machine learning learned was not to recognize the horse, it was to recognize, well, that there was something on the bottom left. All right, so that's what explainability is for, so that's what we would like, because essentially what we want to ask the machine learning is, given a input and uh, a prediction, can you tell me how you figure out what is leaking, right? How, where, where do you get information to get to the conclusion that the correct key or the correct attack point? Well, that seems great in practice, uh, just to write in theory, and we can see where it's going, the thing is, so it doesn't tell us how we're going to combine these explainability techniques and dynamic analysis to develop leakage, right? Because so far, uh, all I explained to you is maybe how we can get some part of the output uh, highlighted, but it doesn't tell you how you go back to know where the leakage comes from. And so that's all the difficulty of code is even, and that's why it took us about one year, over a year to actually really know how to get that done is because you need to be very creative around how to combine those things, which intuitively should make sense uh, to actually get the result you want. So let's deep dive into how you get there. Our game plan was fairly straightforward. Again, we start with an explainer. We're going to give it uh, our train models, and then we're going to give it the trace and the prediction and say, okay, please tell me of the trace, what are the important points for you to make your prediction? We're going to call that the leakage map then we're going to also do uh, run, uh, not necessarily after, but maybe in parallel, uh, a target emulator, which is basically we're going to run um, our target, which is the, a given CPU, uh, in this specific talk, the SMT F4, 32F4, and the firmware. So in our case, the firmware we shoot an AS, and we're going to emulate it uh, to be able to know at which every cycle, instruction cycle in the ARM CPU correspond which uh, opcode, right? So basically we need to know at what time, precise point in time, uh, a given uh, CP, uh, given code instruction was run and then which code instruction was run, right? And so with that, uh, we can combine both of them. Uh, we can combine the leakage map, which tells us, according to machine learning, which part, at what time uh, the leakage occurred and the emulation, which tells us at what time each instruction was run to be able to annotate the code with where the leakage is. That's the idea. 
Uh, in practice, uh, that's where it becomes complicated. Uh, there is, of course, a lot of uh, techniques. Um, here is a screenshot. Here is a figure from one of the recent paper, uh, which is called Fantasy Check for Fantasy Map, which basically we're looking at how efficient it is different type of explainability technique, and you can see some of them have more defined output than others. Uh, in this specific, uh, in our research, we tried a bunch of them, including the uh, guided grad cam, which seemed, uh, when we started, to be giving the most defined and precise leakage. Uh, and then we tested a bunch of them, right? And the idea was which experimental technique would work best for us because we wanted to highlight a very precisely which part of the trace was the most important one. How you do that? Well, you get the explanation. So you run a lot of traces which were successful uh, into the explanation. Here's the activation map technique. Then you combine them and you normalize between zero and one to create some sort of a, uh, a mask. And then uh, you eliminate all the noise and hopefully you get um, the bottom image, which is this uh, leakage map, and you can see it's tried here, and you can see that some places which are lighter are supposed to be the place where uh, the model is leaking the most. So according to activation map, there is, uh, I think it was for byte zero, uh, the very, very early, there was A leakage, and very, very late, around the 4,000 points, so at the end of our traces, uh, some uh, leakage, right? Depending on the technique you use, uh, you're going to get different results. Uh, the first one we tested is SNR, uh, which is not a deep learning technique, but is the standard technique used in traditional attacks to detect whether or not there is a leak. So it's a very much a uh, very robust way, statistical well-proved way, uh, kind of like our baseline. So the signal to noise ratio uh, tells you that, as you can see, there is a main leak and there is a secondary leak somewhere in the middle of the track. So from, and then if we look at Bradcam uh, plus which is one of the latest technique. Uh, the results are not so clear. Uh, we have a bunch of different points uh, which doesn't seem to align very well uh, with the SNR, or at least they are less defined. They are the same place, but not exactly the same. And then uh, the activation map looks almost equivalent uh, to the graph cam. Uh, that was one of the uh, events of activation map look at the output of uh, the layer, the lowest layer. Um, this seems very, very much the same. So how do you benchmark how good these explanations are? So the idea is, well, we have a leak map, right? So what we can do is we can take our test traces that we know the machine learning is successful at predicting, and then we can decide to use the leak map, the leak map and let's say we move the four points or the eight points, which are supposed to be the most important according to the leakage map out of the trace. We can just literally blank them. Blanking them means put them to zero or to minus one, uh, put them to zero, but some idea uh, you Basically, we move the, the information there, and hopefully, if that's the most important part of the prediction, then the accuracy of the model, if you feed it again, should result in aggregate to decrease accuracy, right? The idea is that if you blank out the points which are used by the machine learning to make the prediction, the accuracy should decrease. So mechanically, the best technique should yield the best decrease. Baseline, as I said, 100%, because we only use traces, you remove four points. Why four points is because an instruction text, uh, when we capture them with the oscilloscope, uh, is four points, right? So each cycle of the CPU is supposed to be four points. So if we know that, we say, okay, let's try to, to remove the most important cycle. If we do it with SNR, uh, the technique seems to work, right? It seems we reduce by 57% and 44%. Uh, if we do the activation map, and it was our first very big disappointment uh, sometimes the project uh, last year, uh, not last year, but like a few months back, was like, oh, well, doesn't work that well. SNR is better. So activation map doesn't work really well. And then, if you remember, I should use that the leakage map are almost the same, and the results are the same for GradCam Plus. So the idea seems to, write, to work in the sense that SNR works. Our deep learning explainability, which is way more complicated and should be way better, doesn't. So that was a little bit uh, disappointing and so it was like back to the drawing board, uh, what can we do? Let's go back to that. And so the way we would do, we went about that is like, okay, uh, let's write our own technique because what we want is to only find the top point so we can probably do something with 
a very old idea, which is occlusion, and try to make it a little bit better. So I know it seems weird to say, okay, let's invent a new technique uh, for uh, for the specific task. But the thing is, we are trying to do something very, very unique, uh, or very, very precise. We don't want to have like the exact region and have more like a holistic understanding. We want to have like top five or top 20 points. So because our optimization for our technique is different and the type of underlying algorithm you want to use is a little bit different, we can use occlusion, which is literally try to use a window to do that. And so skilled uh, explanation technique is actually uh, exactly that. It's a hybrid version of occlusion where we start to eliminate the large region until we zoom it down to a small region and then with convolutions, uh, convolutive occlusion, which is something we develop for this, to actually really pinpoint uh, which part of the trace uh, for the region that we think are predictive, which of the point, exact point are the most important. And as you can see, uh, the traces are way cleaner uh, than the one we had before. Uh, and they clearly outline uh, leakage. Also, as you can see, if we took byte zero and byte seven, it is clear that the byte zero is before byte seven for in terms of leakage, which makes a ton of sense because obviously tiny s process one after the other, uh, it's not vectorized code. So that will be exactly what we expect. Okay, so we're like, okay, trace to the code should work, right? So go back to the benchmark, run the thing, and voila, uh, the number are way better, or at least better uh, for point of byte seven. And so, Again, so now we have a technique uh, which works better. Our map is more precise, so we hope that the leakage pinpoint will be more precise. And just to give you a visual comparison, to finish on that side, it's very clear that A, the SNR and code basically find roughly the same region, except the region is a bit better defined with code, which is good because the SNR is not wrong in general. And B, uh, we have something which is cleaner, which means that we have improve over existing set of the art and also finding something completely out of the theoretical model. So fit the theoretical model, be more precise, looks good. And so as I said benchmark shows that in every case is uh, scored actually outperform everything we tested. It's not to say there is not a better way, but this is working for us and this is good enough as we will see. So we tend to favor this thing because it's also quite fast. Uh, it takes, uh, I don't know, about 10 minutes to explain a network. Okay, now that I explain in greater detail how you go from leakage map, to, uh, how you go from model to leakage map, the question is how you go from leakage map to code. Well, for that, as I mentioned, we have an emulator, uh, which is based on unicorn and rainbow. And basically we run it uh, with a firmware and the CPU and we, Basically, have a state automaton who try to emulate what's happening during the leakage map. But the idea is you want to do a start, run the AS, a stop, and basically pick up what is in sync with the leakage map. And then what happened then is you get uh, mapped ASM. So what you get is you get okay, this cycle maps to this time, this this point in the trace map to that cycle, that cycle map to this uh, specific. A CPU instruction. And then what we do is when we have a CPU instruction, uh, we build a tree and the tree we bubble up the instruction to uh, a given um, code line using the debug, the debug symbol of our firmware. The firmware we run, uh, both for uh, the, firmware, the firmware we have is in debug mode. Again, we're back to this idea that this is a tool for developers. So when you test for leakage, you can compile with debug symbol uh, because you don't try to harden it. We just want to debug it. So we have debug symbol will help us to go back from the instruction back to the line of code. And hopefully uh, that gives us an idea of where to map the code. So that's a theory, uh, but we haven't told you or haven't shown you if it's really working practice. And the thing is, uh, before I do that, I want to be on phase three important thing about this project. The first one is, uh, we spend a lot of time talking about explainability because if we don't have extremely precise explainability technique, which exactly outpoint, which exactly pinpoint what point in the trace is responsible for the leakage, we're going to fail. We're going to fail because most instructions on ARM are too 
maybe three, maybe four cycle long uh, at most, right? Not at most, but two, one to two instructions for an addition since the error is standard. So it's literally four to eight points. Like our margin of error is maybe one point, but that's about all we get. So if we don't have precise mapping, then if we map, let's say, 10 points ahead, or if we have a windows of 10 points, it's meaningless for us because then it might be three instructions. And those instructions might belong to different uh, line of code, so basically your analysis is completely botched. At the same time, we need to have an emulator, which is also single cycle precision, because what happens is if you do not take into account, let's say, pipeline flush, if you don't take into account the CPU uh, pipeline size and things like that, you get it wrong. You get it wrong because you're going to shift everything by, let's say, you're wrong, let's say, by one cycle for each addition, then your whole traces is completely shifted, and then even if your leakage mapping is good, you get somewhere in the code which is not relevant. So you need cycle precision emulator, you need cycle precision, a single point precision explanation, so you need something extremely precise. This is very, very much a um, precise work. And then on top of that, you need a bit of computation. Again, as I said, you need to generate about a, we use, a, I think, a 1 million data point, uh, something like that. And then even for the explanation time, we use 60,000 traces. Um, you need 16 model, as I mentioned. You can shorten the time, of course, by using a good model who converts very quickly. You need to generate 16 explanations for all those models in your trace, and then you need to map everything. So with our, with our optimization, that would take you a day or so of work. Uh, and of course, as I said, most of it is parallelizable because the 16 model and 16 explanation can be run on distinct CPU, right? So it's, you can make it 16 times faster trivially. So that's really good because we want to use that as a fast iterative tool for developers. All right, <laughs> so at that point you're like, okay, uh, he gave me a long speech of why it's really hard, so probably they failed. And that's really, really hard because, yeah, emulating a CPU is hard. And I'm telling you, it is true. I don't think we have perfect emulation of CPU. I think we have very precise emulation of the instruction we need for AES. In particular, one thing we don't have, and disclaimer, is we don't have implemented mapping for, uh, for divide. Uh, why uh, is because division is actually takes a lot of cycle and um, a very different branch of cycle on ARM CPU, so we don't really know what to do there. So uh, that's only working for now for AES in full transparency. That being said, um, if we try to apply what I said to our model, uh, what we expect to see in the theoretical sense is we're supposed to, if the model is targeting subite in, then it must exploit something in the add one key because add one key is where you do the key XOR the plain text. So it must have most of the main leakage should be there. So it's a very cool thing. And so what we do to verify that what we said works is to actually try to verify that. And so that's what the schedule output look like. Uh, it's a terminal thing. Uh, you basically run it and at the end it spit out uh, this, uh, as I said, tree, which map uh, cycle instruction, which is not displayed for visibility, to code line, which is uh, basically the numbers, and then I filter everything which is not uh, leaking. And then what this mapping tells you is, yes, the main leakage is on line 213 of add one key. So that's promising. It also have, interestingly enough, a singular leakage, which is later on into uh, the cipher functions. Um, so well, it's line 2713, right? Well, the good news is it's exactly what we predicted. Uh, this is exactly the, the line in the whole code uh, that you can find on GitHub, which is exactly where the key is XOR with the plain text. So the model and scold in general really clearly is using what a theory would predict, which is there is a leak in that specific line because they are doing just, uh, they are changing the value of the register, there's some assignation, uh, some assignment, sorry. And so this is what it is. So that's a success. Uh, that's what gives us confidence that what we do works in practice. It's not a, it's, it's really giving us interesting results. I will not claim it works in every case. I'm sure that with a more complex implementation like masked AES or more complicated security, uh, the result might be drastically different. As I said, uh, 
Our emulator do not fully emulate all the operation in Kindle ARM. Uh, there is still a lot of uncertainty, but however, it works. Uh, I think it's a very promising step towards the right direction of having tool who go back from leakage to uh, exact line of code. As far as we can tell, the first time it has ever been done. Uh, back to the secondary leakage, I don't have a good explanation for it. Uh, the best thing we can come up, I can come up with today is that it's probably when some of the register are unloaded. And so uh, this is where it starts to do the mixed column. If you look at line 371. Uh, so maybe that's what happened is it unloading some of the registers and then can go back. Uh, we did a little bit more analysis for that, but basically it'd be interesting to know why there is secondary leakage. So hopefully today I showed you how we use Scatter to automatically isolate the noble code and show you how it works in practice and show you concretely what is the benefit of the tool. And really our hope is this type of tool, we keep building it and we get feedback from the community to build something which will empower people who develop secure hardware to quickly figure out and patch uh, where the leakage are coming from so we can develop stronger crypto in an easier way and a faster iteration. So we all benefit from uh, stronger, more secure devices. Um, and the takeaway of the talk, uh, as I said, uh, as we discussed last year, machine learning is a way uh, to automate uh, such an attack and you reach out of the art with it. So it's really one of the most, uh, it's at the forefront of such an attack. And uh, this year we flipped uh, the use case on its head, which is really what was the intent of the project from the onset two years ago, which is to try to use all those knowledge to actually help developers building better tooling for them to reduce the cost of developing secure implementation and make them better. So that being said, this is a very, very new field, a uh, very exciting field with a lot of ideas, a lot of energy around it. And it can really use more interest, more people interested in it. So if you have some interest into crypto, a little bit of machine learning, it's a great time to get in and uh, work with the community on this type of ideas. Thank you so much for attending this virtual talk. I wish it would be in person. I'm going to miss uh, DEF CON as you will probably do. Uh, I hope you're all well. And if you would like to follow up and keep up with what we're doing, uh, we try to publish as fast as we can, uh, modulo some delay uh, to provide you information about uh, what we do on session and attacks at, uh, on the website. Uh, hopefully we'll have an official project uh, website in the future as well. Thank you so much uh, for listening to this talk um, and then uh, do not uh, hesitate to reach out on Twitter or by email or any other mean. Uh, happy to answer questions. Thank you so much. Bye.